what we really need in Nigeria are the leaders that has the interests of Nigerians at heart. In his word, in this particular interview, Chris Okobia, he said that we need people that are African streak and Nigerian streak. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Depending where you're watching this video from and the time you're going to see this video, I remember my humble self. The if you're coming across my page for the first time, I would like you to share my videos, like, comment, and follow my page if you're not following me. This particular video we are going to watch between Omoyele Shawure and Chris Wokobia in a Rice TV interview. These people, they pointed that something that made me to have interest in what they said. Do you know that sometimes I ask myself how some people that used to come out and tell us that Nigeria is the largest economy in Africa. How really are they, how did they come out with such a thing? Yes, we are giant of Africa. If you say that we are we 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 have the largest economy in Africa, a, a, a country that cannot boast of steady electricity, a country that cannot boast of good standard airports, a country that, that cannot boast of so many basic amenities. I don't know how they always come out with such a thing. I don't want to talk too much in this particular video I'm bringing here so that you're going to listen to these people and hear what they say. We need leaders, not rulers. As you're watching this video, try to share it, like it, comment and follow my page if you're not following me. Just listen to young people. I know, I know that the, the kind of leaders we have, I don't know if I would say that these people that call themselves our masters are the ones that impose these kind of people to us so that they will be listening to them and do everything they ask them to do in their own interest, not in the interest of Africa or interest of Nigeria as a nation. Just watch this video and do the needful. I remember my humble self, the Eichmann. And first off, we have Chris Nwa Oko Bia, who was a notable presidential candidate in 2011, and he is currently a member of the Obida T Presidential Campaign Council in 2023. Also joining us is Omoyele Soware, who is founder of the African Action Congress Party and a notable presidential candidate in 2019 and most recently in 2023. Very warm welcome, Soware and Umwa Okobia. Umwa Okobia is joining us from the Abuja studio and Soware is here with us in Lagos. Soware, let's start with you. With a population of over 200 million citizens expected to increase to 400 million, by 2050, Nigeria, Africa's largest economy, faces very significant human development challenges, currently ranking 150 out of 157 countries in the World Bank's Human Capital Index. Where did we get it wrong and what lies ahead? Well, thank you for bringing me. And uh, it's also great to see uh, Chris on the screen on the other side. I think uh, it's very interesting that the World Bank is the one expressing to the world that we are now lacking in uh, human capital development. But what we must understand is that Nigeria was subjected to economic policies that actually degraded its capacity to produce people with capacity. And that was through the structural adjustment programs okay. uh, that was imposed on the military and that was executed precisely to achieve the objective that they are now reporting on. I became an activist. Can you tell us first some of those foremost, policies? Yes. First and foremost, mm -hmm. in 1989, as I was arriving at the University of Lagos, okay. the World Bank was also giving Nigeria a $120 million loan, supposedly to fix our universities. But they knew that we didn't need that loan. What we needed was a leadership that could have invested in education, but the structural adjustment program specifically, mm -hmm. specifically targeted the number of universities. Said there were too many universities. Government had no business investing in free education. But look at it. Some thirty something years later, the people that were half trained okay. by Nigerian universities are now being brought to the UK 
Europe and America as doctors after COVID-19 hit them. So had we had that opportunity to progress when we started free education, invested in education the way we should, had we had the opportunity to have an unbroken leadership in the civilian sector, we would not have had that break that led to the destruction of that human capital development they are reporting upon. So they are guilty. The World Bank, the IMF, they are guilty of this. They know the kind of policies that they have spread over time. But you know leadership changes hands, so the leadership then will be different from the leadership today. They, Whoever they, put the report together will be different from who's they haven't managing changed other ways aspects. Because we are still dealing with structural adjustment program. The current dislocation that they imposed on Nigeria through the removal of so-called forest subsidy, it was a World Bank and IMF prescription. And the man who read it on the day of his own inauguration probably didn't even think about the fact that the moment you have 80% of your economy in the informal sector, mm. you just can't come up one day and destroy opportunities that people have to do business and leave. Because you already know the statistics of how many Nigerians are living below $1 mm -hmm. per day. Mm -hmm. And what is $1 today is seven, I mean, almost 950 Naira to a dollar. As of six months ago, the Naira was stronger than it is today. It has depreciated over time. So what I'm saying is that it's not as if we should blame the World Bank and the IMF all the time for, uh, but you would link that with the kind of leadership they also promote. I'm talking about the West on the continent of Africa, the kind of characters they impose. And I, need, I think we're going to talk about you, about this later. You know, since independence on the continent of Africa, what it did, you know, real leaders of Africa who fought for independence, some of them coups, mm -hmm. some of them, you know, mysterious plane, you know, crashes. And they have now also started directly, you know, and you now have reached a point where even military rule has returned to the continent of Africa. Africa is not making progress uh, with the return of the military to power. You now find even a new generation of young Africans who are hailing military Boy Scouts, mm -hmm. who are taking over all these um, African and West African countries. That's not progress. Mm -hmm. uh, but you cannot divorce that from the history of Africa, how Africa got to where it is, and the position of these institutions, international institutions, who keep imposing upon Africa's economic policies that would not allow Africa to develop, especially uh, their position on education, their position on public welfare, housing. You know, when I came to Lagos... So you're in, saying they are currently dictating they are. Africa's yes. status at the moment? Look, the, the, the most powerful person internationally in Nigeria is probably the IMF country director. They can walk into your, you know, your president at any time and tell him, oh, this is not going to work. Even when they say it in private and you don't listen, they call a press conference and say, we are not going to accept Nigeria's economic policy because this is not good for us. But they know what they are doing. They are, they are preparing your country for their factories to dump whatever it is they want to dump on you. It is easier now to impose African, I mean, Americans' wheat on the Nigerian uh, uh, bread industry to mm -hmm. make bread. But guess what? The farmers who are growing wheat in America are the most subsidized farmers in the US. So how do you compete with a farmer who is subsidized to grow wheat in America? And through the WTO, the World Trade Organization imposes that you must take a certain tonnage of wheat into your country, whether you like it or not. That will be your own local production of wheat, mm. which we are capable of doing. So a lot of people don't know that some of these policies are part of the reasons why, why the West don't like African leaders who are conscious, who are brilliant, who understand the mechanics of how they manipulate our economic policies to pauperize us. They like, you know, they like cooking up numbers. You mentioned earlier that Nigeria is the biggest economy on the continent of Africa. I don't know how you came about that. Mm -hmm. How are we big when the we don't have electricity? You the understand? Potentials. Well, maybe potential. The potentials. The economic but how are we big when you don't have electricity? Buoyant. You can't even electrify like mm -hmm. half of a city. Mm -hmm. How can you be big? Yeah. It's not a big economy. Well, let's look at our Nigeria is assets. the big for nothing, you know, mm -hmm. what fella used to call BBC, big blind country mm -hmm. on the continent of with Africa. The, with huge potential. It has huge potential, but, but for you to, have, to get to that potential, you must remove leadership. the roadblocks. Mm -hmm. Leadership is a Absolutely. major, major factor in making and sure that Nigeria is today. in charge of the 
you know, the destiny of Africa. The fact that we need ECOWAS to speak to Boy Scouts in Nigeria and all that shows our weakness. Mm. If Nigeria were to be the right country, you know, in position that it ought to be on the continent of Africa, we don't need West Africa to tell our neighbors in Nigeria that they should sustain democracy. Absolutely. Let me bring in Uwa Okobia from our Abuja studio. Uwa Okobia, how would you analyze Nigeria's current government and state of leadership in line with what Sora just said? What uh, updates on the judiciary matters ongoing? And do you foresee Nigeria having a seat at global leadership gatherings, including the BRICS and the upcoming G20, within the nearer future? Let me first of all appreciate uh, Arise TV for this uh, incisive um, dialogue, if you like. Let me salute my, my brother there. Um, interestingly, we've come a long way. We were born in the same year. And um, our passion for a new Nigeria, a new Africa, and a new deal for our people is top notch. But let me clearly say that as we discuss these issues, we must locate leadership in Nigeria and in lead Africa in proper perspective. Do we have leaders? And some of my friends will say, oh, at best what we have are rulers who are egocentric, who are self-centered, who are egotistic, and to whom leadership is just about me, myself, and I. I, I think that the way forward for Africa is first to grow leaders who are nationalistic, who are pan-African, and who, beyond populism, care about their people and about our continent. We need pan-Africanists who truly will determine the destiny and the fate of the African continent and, indeed, our people. Um, can Nigeria get into Briggs and perhaps occupy a seat at the United Nations Security Council? The answer is yes, but how? When? And how can we do that? And let me say simply that we must first of all grow leaders who are totally people-centered and people-centric. We must grow leaders who truly care about you and I, who truly care about our country, and who truly care about the masses of our people. Until that is done, you know, th there's a popular cliche that we all grew up knowing, and that obtains even in the deepest uh, and, the, and, the, and the most exclusive rooms where policies and global issues are discussed. Charity begins at home. How much charity do you have at home? Um, my brother there noted something which is very germane. Do we have uh, leaders who are able to say to the World Bank and the IMF, to, to this extent is yes, and to this extent is a capital no? Because every country that's come out of poverty to promise. Every country that's come out of disease and despondency mm -hmm. to greatness. Every country that's come out of uh, want to plenty has policies that are intrinsic, traditional, and natural to it. Not policies thrown on her by the World Bank, the Bretton Wood, and the IMF. And for as long as our leaders I have the incumbent president uh, a few days ago, saying that he's under pressure. If you emerge through a credible electoral process, you don't need pressure to ask Nigerians to do what is right. If your electoral victory, quote unquote, were proper, trite and right, fair and just, all you need to do is hop into the Nigerian uh, presidential aircraft and go to Niger and negotiate with the people. Mm -hmm. But because you lack the moral nexus to so do, because you lack the credibility to so do, because you lack uh, the capacity on account of how you emerged to so do, Nigerians will look at you like the, uh, I don't know how verified the statement is from Burkina Faso, that they know who actually won the last election, so you don't have a right to tell them or school the world on democracy. So I think that that's why I agree with my, my brother and friend. Um, African leaders must ensure that they emerge through honorable processes. African leaders must ensure that democracy means truly what it is. A government of the people, as defined by Abraham Lincoln, for the people and by the people. And when we truly uh, dish and deal service to the people, then 
we can, as it were, emerge not only as leaders of the West African sub-region, not only as leaders of the Sahel region, but leaders of Africa, because we're the most populous country in Africa. But I think that uh, what we're doing today is a call to the conscience of our nation, a call to the conscience of the political leaders, a call to the conscience of our people, and indeed, a new generation that are saying that things must be done rightly. I, I believe that if we have leaders that are responsible and responsive to the people, if we have leaders that are Afrocentric and African-centered, if we have leaders who are pan-African and pan-Nigerian, then sooner rather than later, the, the global organizations that care and that are sincere will come cutting us. But until that is done, um, a place in the United Nations Secret Security Council is like a wait for Godot. Seeking for a place in the BRICS is like a wait for Godot. And I want to say very strongly as we go on with this conversation, that the time has come for us to move away from populism to patriotism and nationalism. Thank we you. need leaders who will care and not, and not let, me, let, me, let, me, let me chisel this home. Um, my brother talked about uh, the fuel subsidy. All over the world, in Britain, in the United States of America, in Germany, farmers and farming is subsidized. All over the world, largely, energy is subsidized. Why is the IMF and the World Bank telling us that the way out of the morass is subsidy? I think that what leaders must do in Africa and indeed this country is to cop corruption. If I tell you what corruption goes on in the oil sector, you will know that the solution to our problem is not in the removal of subsidy, but in the cobbing of corruption. Trillions of dollars, trillions of naira are stolen by people who are protected by the state are stolen by people who are protected by the PDP, the APC, and those who politic with our collective destiny. The way out of the morass is to check corruption, not increasing poverty for the masses of our people and making lives better for the rich. Thank That's you. the way to go. We must be African-centric and pan-Nigerian in leadership. We must be African-centric in pan-African leadership. Thank you, Umwa Okobia. Let's bring in Sowari for the very next question.